Hello, everybody, and welcome to the China Manufacturing Decoded podcast. This is episode 126, and I am your host today. This is Renaud Anjouran from Sophist, and I am today with Liz Long from Learn to Make a Product. Uh, we're going to go into Liz's uh, background and what she does in a minute. Uh, the topic is starting to develop a first product. So this is not for big companies. Typically, this is not for people who already have a lot uh, going and their own products on the market and things like that. This is more about the first steps. Uh, and this is crucially important because a lot of people don't really dare to take these first steps and they don't really know how to do it. And sometimes they do it, but in a wrong way. So they get burned. So yeah, let's go into it. Let's try to understand sort of some good practices and bad practices and some, and, and, and some good tips from, uh, from Liz. And I have known Liz for a well, while. I don't know, maybe 10 years at this point. Maybe yeah, more. I, th I think so. Maybe more. Right. Maybe more. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So Let's get into it. So, uh, Liz, can you please give us an intro about you and, and, and what you do? Sure. So I run a platform that helps people launch products. So that's everything from executing the design, where and how to get it manufactured, and then how to brand it and price it and launch it so that it sells, right? So how to create a compelling brand and excellent photography and an e-commerce site and your email marketing strategy, you know, everything that is required to get a physical product successfully out into the world. Right, right. And do you, do you work mostly with people who are developing their own product versus private labeling something already yeah. on the market? Yes. Almost everyone we work with is developing their own product. Now they mm -hmm. might be doing a bit of a hybrid where they're, they're kind of private labeling and maybe changing just a few key things that they think really improves the product. So we certainly mm -hmm. have some people like that, but um, yeah, where we specialize in is really people launching brands, not just selling, you know, another product on Amazon, which is a totally different um, and, and very valid <laughs> way to do it. But, but we're mm -hmm. focused on people who are launching their own businesses. Right. So, okay. And you've been doing that for, for quite some time, right? Um, you, you, you had your own products, right? And then you've been helping a number of people launch their own products. Can you tell us a little bit about the kinds of products, product lines that, that you've been working on over the years? Yeah, so we have helped launch hundreds and hundreds of different types of products, everything from sewn goods to cosmetics to wearables to home goods, you know, really anything that you would find like in the, in a regular consumer store, um, we help with the only exclusions is, are we don't do a lot of food and, and kind of like heavy equipment, you know, heavy machinery and very complex, um, uh, you know, computer devices, like things like that are a little out of scope, but right. most right. people come in with one of those other ideas and they get the idea really from their life, right? They, they're going through life, they're a parent and they want something um, you know, for, for their children, or we get a lot of doctors who come in and have a device or, or something that they have thought of. So it comes from people seeing a need and then being motivated mm -hmm. to fill that need. Yeah, right, right, right. Okay. So let's cover first, you know, the very first steps, because there's a lot of people and maybe some listeners of, of this podcast who think, Dave, you know, I have a day job. I have, I have an activity. I, you know, I don't really know if I if I can start that on the side or should I just stop everything and go right in? You know, what 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 would you tell someone in that situation? So here's what I'll say. The the people who have I who I have seen be most successful did have day jobs and they transitioned over time, right? Mm -hmm. It is very exciting when someone quits their job because their business is generating enough revenue. Um, so that's a wonderful milestone, but I think it depends on a person, someone's personality and temperament. Sometimes having no income stream, you know, because you've quit your job and you're going all in can be very stressful for people. Mm -hmm. And they, they kind of, they can't rely, you know, there, there's, they, they operate from this place of like stress and fear, and, and it can be a little harder for them to launch other people. They thrive on pressure. So I think it really depends on who you are. There's no one answer, but 
being able to have funds from a day job that you can invest in the business over time, right? So maybe this quarter you work on investing in a website, this quarter you work on doing some paid ads, you know, it, that can be really successful. Mm, right, right, right. And because a key consideration here is how long is going to take between, you know, I have an idea, I want to start working on it and I'm starting to make some sales <laughs> and generate some some margin, right? This this can be a long, long time, right? Uh, yes. I mean, so, in, and in the- there's always there's always outliers, but mm-hmm. I see most people start to get traction within about six months of launching, six to twelve months. If you, if you're really struggling to get sales. After, mm-hmm. you know, that amount of time, it's usually something hasn't been done correctly. And it could mm-hmm. be something as simple as you just have terrible pictures. Like it doesn't, it doesn't mean your product idea is necessarily bad, but it is a sign, you know, you should be able to do it in that amount of time. Hmm. So you say it from launch to success, but what about pre launch <laughs> right? You, you got to work on the product development review maybe some prototypes and try to select some suppliers and yada, 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 and, and, and um, maybe do some certifications on, on your product, um, you know, launch mass production, check on what's going on, uh, manage the logistics, all the shipment to the market, warehousing, fulfillment, all these kinds of things. Um, this should also come in the equation, right? Yes. And that is the part that I find takes longer, right? Mm -hmm. So people expect that part, you know, they think, oh, three to six months, I will have all of that done. I rarely see that happen. And that's Mm -hmm. even when they're getting help connections. You know, I, I see it take one to two years for people to do all of those activities. And partly, you know, you asked the question about having a day job that that factors into it, right? If you're not working you know, nine to six on your business, it's going to take a little more time to get off the ground. So I really encourage people to be patient. Um, There's always outliers. There's always people that do it faster, but that's just an average timeline. Mm -hmm. And the people that you help, do they usually start just as you mentioned, they have an idea maybe from their life or something. And they say, well, there's a need for that. There's nothing like I'm going to, you know, scratch my own itch or or whatever, you know, I don't know of a more elegant way to say it, but I'm going to, I'm going to make it happen. And I have an idea about how it could be done and, you know, and and they go into developing the new product versus it starts to, as you mentioned, you know, maybe set up an Amazon shop, just private label something. And then at one point they get to, hey, I know the product category pretty well now. I have I have a good feel for the market. I I understand what you know what makes consumers or customers tick, and I see a need for a new kind of product, and I'm going to work on it now. Right? These are two different, yeah. and I think two valid approaches. Right? Um, they are. Do you do you see some issues with going okay, private label first versus new yeah. products first? With the private labeling option, I see it succeed if people have some sort of built-in audience. So if they're an influencer, if they're very tapped into some community so that they can kind of test these private label products with an existing audience and see if their brand and their, uh, you, you know, that they can, if they can sell. When someone is starting from, from zero, no audience, no nothing, I find it's almost just as hard to sell the private label products as your own unique ones. You have to still Hmm. do this, you know, maybe not just as hard, but it's, it's hard enough. And if you have a limited budget and you put all of it into getting your private label products ready to go, Hmm. I, you know, I think you're better off just investing in the thing that you really want to do in the first place. Hmm. Well, yeah, that's, that's quite valid because I mean, if you're going to be a distributor to a a supplier that has that, already developed that product, you're still going to have to buy to their minimum order quantity. Uh, That takes cash. Uh, You're still going to have to set up maybe your Amazon shop and so on and so forth and and, and put the money into fulfillment and and so on. And still going to have to probably 
drive traffic, maybe pay yes, some. Yes, that's the big expense. You're going to have to market, right. right? Marketing is, after the inventory cost, marketing is really where you need to put cash in. And so mm -hmm. it costs the same amount to market a private label product as it does a custom one that you've done yourself. Mm. Well, I mean, one might even say that if you set a Me Too product uh, in a crowded marketplace and so on, you might have to yes. spend more. And yes, I think that is true. And yeah. you're usually competing on price in that place so that right. then your, your margins are a little thinner. Right, right. How, how are you going to generate the margin to actually pay for that? I mean, it's a, I, I really admire, there's a lot of people doing it. And some of them, some of them are really doing great, but wow. It's tough. I mean, if if you hit gold and you're in the right category and there's there's a lot of yeah. uh, a lot of demand and for some reason you're well positioned and you do a good job and you kind of ride the wave, that's great. But it when you be. and I, I I find those people are very data driven. So if that's mm -hmm. you, if you're a numbers person, if you can be very clinical. Um, those people succeed in the private label market. The people that tend to be a li little bit more creative, enthusiastic, you know, they're very passionate about a particular type of product. They tend to do a bit better on the um, kind of unique brand side. It's, it's just a little bit of a different temperament. Right. Oh, absolutely. And that's, that's a great point. Actually, I never thought about it this way. <laughs> right, right. So, I mean, ideally you develop your own product and you, you send a few you know, pre-production samples or something to some influencers. And so if it's really a nice product, they might review it for free. They might not ask. Um, I know it's becoming a rarity, right? From it is. What, it is. What, I, what I hear from our customers, but um, some, of, some of them have had some good luck. Oh, it's, um, it, yeah. it's going in either direction. So it is harder to mm -hmm. get people to do anything without paying them. However, mm -hmm the small percentage of people who just make an awesome product go mm -hmm. viral more than ever before, right? Like, they, like people are excited to, to find and, and, and promote a product they really believe in. So it, it happens. It's just a little bit more of an uphill battle. Mm. Right. 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 And well, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Have you, I, I, I mean, I heard some interviews about people who started private labeling and get to know their market and then said, okay, I see a hole here. I'm going to develop something new. Uh, and I, I've also talked and some of our clients actually are in that um, situation where they, they have trouble justifying all the investment into a new product because sometimes they want like the perfect product that they think would be perfect for their market. But then, you know, the industrial design is expensive to do it very nice, the, <laughs> getting to a final prototype. Uh, if they have very high expectations, you know, in the finishing and things like that, they might go, you know, in round after round after round of prototypes and then there's, you know, production and so on and so forth. And they, uh, they sometimes have trouble justifying that. Uh, does it sometimes require maybe a lot of passion and maybe closing the eyes a little bit on you know it does but what you're possibility. you know you're describing the presence of risk and whenever you have the potential right. for big reward there's also going to be big risk usually right those are usually symmetrical things and it, it's hard to get around that yes it's going to be expensive it might fail that's kind of the price of entry if you want to play the game right 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 yeah actually that's a good point we'll get back to it um in terms of product categories, do you find that to get to market relatively fast, okay, relatively fast, not get, you know, completely drowned under very, very long processes and a lot of investments and things like that, do you feel that some uh, product categories are um, easier, uh, make it, you know, maybe you have lower entries to uh, barriers to entry, yes. maybe require lower investment? So any sewn product is, you know, apparel, accessories, home goods is going to be easier to launch, but it's going to be a bit harder to market because it's crowded, right? And then products that are original, you know, might require like molds, tooling are going to be more expensive upfront to launch, but are usually a bit easier to sell if they're filling a specific niche. Um, so you kind of pay on one end or the other. 
Right. Okay, that's an interesting point. Yeah. If you if you have a hard product and maybe you want a um a custom design enclosure in plastic, yes. Uh, that's going to be a, a higher investment. And making the tooling usually takes, I don't know. If it's in China, it might take six weeks. Uh all you know, all all said and done. Uh if it's in uh in other countries, it might be two or three months. And depending on the size of the product and the complexity, maybe of the mechanical elements, it could be many tens of thousands of dollars, right? Yeah. So, and, and you have the certifications too, right? Like if you're making a sweater, yeah. there's not much testing. We just have to put a label on it, you know, an appropriate label and we're done. Mm-hmm. Um, for other products, that's not the case. So you have that burden as well. Oh, yeah, 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 right. And then what is <laughs> in the, let's say, relatively common consumer goods, what's like the worst category? Would it be electronics? Or... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know what the worst category is? Perishables. That's the worst category because mm-hmm. it's in food. It's in anything, anything with a shelf life because mm-hmm. you, you have to go through formulation. You have all the testing burdens. You can't just, you know, you have like the FDA, you have all these kinds of mm-hmm. things you have to meet. And if you don't sell it in a given time, you're <laughs> you know, right. that's it. Um, yeah, so I would right. actually say that's probably one of the riskier ones. Oh yeah, right, 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 right. Yes, and um, yeah, I was thinking electronics because yeah, you, um, especially the uh, the, the um, RF electronics that come with um, emissions, right? So f- for the US, you have uh, FCC, and 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 maybe you know if you have batteries and things like that, it could go up and up and up. Uh, to set into the EU, you have different directives for, for the CE mark, right? Uh, you might have uh, low voltage and um, RAD, et cetera, et cetera. And all of that, every time is thousands of dollars and and, and maybe weeks of um, of waiting, especially if it doesn't pass because <laughs> the design doesn't always pass. And they say, well, this is uh, emitting too much, sorry. You get to to uh, to redesign the PCBA. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, yeah, th- 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 this is uh, this is not an easy category because also you have all kinds of failures that will come up, and a bad design. You might not see that yeah. it's a bad design at the <laughs> prototyping stage, right? But then, uh, when you have five thousand units in in the market and you get a you you get ten percent returns then you see it was a bad design or yeah. maybe it was really poorly manufactured or something uh that that's a tough category that's really yeah it's, it, you know that is one of the categories that it is important to get help and guidance whether you're mm-hmm. paying a consultant whether you, you 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 should not just go through the wilderness by yourself in that category um mm-hmm. The other thing I'll say, though, is that category is probably the easiest to raise outside investment money for. Mm -hmm. People are are interested in that area Um, in this in the way that like if you're launching a line of bathing suits or something, you're not going to you know, it's it's harder to get investment money. It's harder to get kind of excitement around that. But Mm -hmm. um, in our digital era, anything electronic or anything with an app, you know, people Mm -hmm. are, are into. So there is a little bit higher of a kind of reward factor there yeah that's so true yeah because most i mean hardware products with electronics usually also come with software right so it might be embedded firmware uh, but many of them come with an app and there's some code on the server somewhere and exchanging ex- exchanging and processing data etc cetera, etc cetera. and this is this is what gets investors more excited that's true now before you just earlier in the episode you mentioned this risk you develop a new product you have a number of different kinds of risk right is it going to sell well is it technically going to work and 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 you know and be nice are you going to have some uh, some production issues etc cetera, etc cetera. and 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 one thing that comes up very often with companies that develop a new product is okay where can we get funding right and one thing that comes back to them very often is Look, you don't even have a prototype. <laughs> you just have an idea. It's not worth very much at all. Do you agree with that? Do you see the same thing? I do. So I see that people really have to pay for development on their own. Mm-hmm. And by development, I mean getting to the prototyping phase, getting some 
photos done, working on your messaging, you know, a simple website that explains what you're doing. All of those things will help you attract an investor. Um, it's just harder without them. Right, right. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I was wondering for people who are, you know, about to start developing a new product, what kind of um, of tools or, you know, websites, resources, and, 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 and others do you suggest to them? So, you know, of course, I would suggest our platform because I think you can get great help at, at a relatively affordable price. Um, when it comes to selling, I think Shopify is a wonderful solution. I still, all these years, you know, I haven't found a solution I like better. Um, so, so I always suggest considering that. And then the other thing that's become helpful are there, there's just a lot more sites where you can get great photography. You can get even great like copywriting done that have sprung up to help all of the Amazon sellers, the Shopify sellers, the Etsy sellers. And so it used to be, we had to work with some agency for thousands and thousands of dollars to do all of this stuff. And it's just, it's that the economy has kind of been created around this whole makers movement. And so you can get a lot done um, mm. for not that much money. Right. Right. Yeah. There's so many people um, developing their own offer, right. In the U S it's, it's, yeah. it's amazing. I like, amazing. you know, I like Suna for product photography. Um, th there's a bunch. It, now that, that said, I, I still think people should get some help deciding on who they work with, because what I mm -hmm. see, right. And you talk about risk. Mm -hmm. I see poor partner choice with it, whatever mm -hmm. you're doing, whatever you're doing, whether it's on the factory side, branding, oh, yes. web development, poor partner choice takes people down more than anything else because they go and choose the wrong person to help develop their website. You know, even if you're making a Shopify website, you're going to need a developer to help customize it. Right. Mm -hmm. You pay that person and they just don't do a good job because you didn't know what to look for in the first place. And mm. these people are, have limited budgets. And so if they bleed out money on something like that, it can really damage them, right? It's, oh, yes. It can be kind of a, an, a game ending decision. So, so I think getting a, re, a reality check and when I'm working with people, that's one of, I would say that's like the number two thing that we do, if not number one, um, is evaluating and making sure you're working with the right people. And I've kind of developed over time, almost a sixth sense of, of who someone should work with. And it's not the same for everyone, right? It's, it's very product dependent. Um, but, but I just think it's an important, uh, you know, oh, an important yeah. thing to consider. Right, right. Yeah. Then tapping the right network right away will save so much time to a company. You know, I, I, um, yeah, <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. And uh, just looking at the uh, the manufacturing side, we're, I mean, we've worked with so many clients who were working with, you know, who had picked the, the wrong manufacturer. Yeah. And, and they're like, we, we don't even know how to get out of this relationship. Yeah. <laughs> like they have the molds. We can't even pull the molds out. We don't have a legal agreement. Uh, we have all kinds of problems. They don't want to give us any rebate. We don't have a contract. We can't do anything, you know. And oh, we thought that, um, you know, contracts were totally useless in China. Oh, really? You know, we thought that, uh, you know, we thought that this manufacturer was was so good. Like they were working with our competitors. They told us about that, and we we thought if they do the same, we'll be all right. But actually, you know, so we never. <laughs> documented the quality requirements and now we have all these problems and we can't even explain to them what's wrong how to do right people are completely lost uh, yeah. just because they trusted the, uh, the the supplier way too much or oh, we thought it, it was a factory actually it's just a couple of people in an apartment <laughs> yeah. yes that's the yes it's it's filled with landmines right exactly so this is um yeah i i think um what you just said that working with the wrong people people who are a bad fit that's what will take down a um a new company the the, the fastest right is this what you yeah. said this is the way you say absolutely right? and sometimes there's this gray area where they are a good factory on paper but they're not the right factory for your product, yes, right? So yes. it, that that's the other piece of it. Right. Oh, yeah. I mean, I often tell people, you know, Foxconn 
is a great manufacturer for Apple. You know, they're huge, but Apple is huge too. So they pay attention to Apple. And Apple has hundreds of people on the ground, you know, close to the manufacturing facilities, making sure, you know, checking supply chain security, checking, you know, all the new product introduction, validation runs and so on, checking quality, checking social compliance, you know, and you don't have this army on the ground, <laughs> right? And the obvious way to look at it is you go to a line or in, in a Foxconn factory that works for Apple, maybe it's great. You go one floor below, you look at another line that, they look, that, that, you know, that was set up for another customer, and maybe it's horrible mm. because they didn't put any process engineering into it. And, they, you know, they're not really supervising it properly because all the resources are going for the top three customers. So Apple, uh, yeah, is 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 um, enjoying the relationship with Foxconn, uh, but you might run into all kinds of problems if you try to work with them, if in the first place they accept to work with you, right? But it's just an example, but there's no good factory in the absolute. I think that's what you mean, right? Yes, absolutely. And well, and there are some bad factories in the absolute. <laughs> but yes, yes. yes, yes. <laughs> but on the good side, yes, it's it is very uh dependent on what what your goals are and and your size and all of that stuff. Right. So let's say there's when you have one of your clients is um developing a new product and they need a manufacturer and it's a kind of product is a category where like you haven't worked before because you know there's, there's, there's so many different categories and types of materials and processes and so on. This is going to happen, right? So mm-hmm. how long, uh, let's say you don't have a good factory in your network. How long is it going to take them to actually find the right, the right supplier? So part of what I have tried to do, and increasingly over the years, this is where I put my attention and time, is developing an ecosystem. So mm-hmm. just because in my brain, Liz's brain, I don't have the exact right thing for someone. I know who to ask, right? There's a whole network of specialists around. And so the strength of that ecosystem makes the time it takes for someone who's working with us much quicker, right? Because we can tap into the information they need. If, If someone is out in the world, just doing it by themselves and searching, I, I almost give it like a 50-50 50-50 chance they're going to find what they need. Maybe 70-30 with the odds not in their favor. It can be very, right. very hard. Yeah, that's what I would say too. <laughs> yes, unfortunately. I mean, it depends on the, the category, right? But and there's some categories where it's much worse. They try to yes, yeah, they try to look in China for, I don't know, factory making um, yeah, furniture or like some very simple garments like t-shirts right. or things like that. And right. Oh, but this no. is this is part of the issue because there will be agents, trading companies who mm-hmm. are not a specialist in a product category, but instead of saying that and kind of passing off the project to someone who is or getting advice, they will just go forward and try and get the business. And that's where people run into trouble when they're working with an intermediary who just doesn't know that much about their category, but doesn't want to turn the project down. Right, right, right. An intermediary might act as a screen and sort of own the relationship and not not show who really is manufacturing or what. And maybe they swap, you know, so from one factory to the other and yeah. the customer will not know anything. And maybe, you know, then the new factory does things in a new way or they they use a slightly different material and it may have a very strong impact, <laughs> right? I'm sure you have seen that. I uh, have. It. I'm actually curious your opinion on this because there, there are a couple intermediaries we work sometimes with when someone is sourcing something, like you talked about the, the Amazon, you know, very simple products mm-hmm. who they don't like the customer to be in touch with the factory, but they will allow on-site quality control inspections with your own agent. They'll allow as many site mm-hmm. visits that you need. They, they give that access. They just, you know, they don't facilitate kind of a direct ordering relationship. And that's a gray area for me where I think if it's the right partner and if the, the 
entrepreneur, if the brand just doesn't have the time or desire to do all the legwork themselves and mm-hmm. give feedback about sampling, I think that can, for certain product categories, be okay. But my line mm-hmm. is is that if you can send your own agent to the factory to see the product before you pay, you know, the balance payment or whatever it is, then mm-hmm. I think that that could work in certain scenarios. I do you do agree. you agree with that? I I would agree. Provided it's very clear from the beginning. Yes. 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 <laughs> because what I see very often is someone who's saying, yeah, I'm going to help and blah, 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 blah. And then it's like, oh, send me the payments. And, you know, in the end, they are the, the quote unquote agent, but they, they're a trading company, right? And that was never clear from the beginning. And mm-hmm. they keep all the communications through their mailbox and through their WeChat account and so on. And, um, and that, that's, that's, not, um, that's not correct. I don't think that's no, right. Not. And you know, I want to, I want to uh, correct something I just said also. It, it can sometimes be an okay way to start and get your foot in the door. That's mm-hmm. easy. You know, if you found the right person and you get product and you don't have to do maybe as much work, but it's, it's right. really never going to be a long-term solution as you grow the business. So you need to just be aware of that. Um, yes. Some people are in the lucky camp, you know, and would say, well, yeah. I've been working that way for 10 years and never had any problems. <laughs> so there are exceptions, uh-huh. but there are also many cases where, yes, I will agree with you, this this is not very sustainable. Or, or at one point, you you need to make changes and they resist. They don't want to make the changes, you know? Yeah. All kinds of issues, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, and I had... Just one last question for you, because you you mentioned that in a, a previous conversation we had, is that one of the issues you see come back again and again is that people think that all of the work is in developing the new product and getting the the, the prototypes, you know, the pre-production samples, um, all confirmed. And then once it's confirmed, they say, okay, like, okay, you want the money, I send you the money, and, you know, I'm waiting for delivery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember you say that this was a huge uh, mistake and a very common mistake. Can, can you elaborate on that a bit? Yes. Well, I, you know, this is something that you see probably every month. Mm. Here's the thing. People, how do I say this? They, they outsource their, they outsource control, right? They assume that the factory is the expert that will do everything that needs to be done, you know, and they don't have to right. worry about anything else because this factory has their best interest. They, they, they're overly optimistic. And what you need to be is overly pessimistic at that pace. You need to imagine that everything is going to go wrong and you need to micromanage and control, especially in that first order really everything that happens because in, and I'm talking about first orders in particular, because you, it's like the dating period. You're still testing and getting to know a supplier. I always tell people that the first order you place is almost like sampling. It's like an extension of, of trying to figure out, you know, the supplier's strengths and their weaknesses. And so you cannot take your eye off the road at that phase. And it's really important for them to find a partner like you or someone who can go in and be on the ground if they cannot be there. Right, right, right. And um, yeah, be overly, overly cautious and yes. communicate, always communicate. Yeah. And, and yeah. on those, yeah. you know, second, third, fourth orders, you can relax a bit, mm-hmm. yeah, right? You you can yeah. have, but but you just need to just really imagine the worst. I, I don't know how else to say it because you'd be yeah. amazed at what can go wrong. And the thing that people should watch for is, Anything that has come up during sampling, right? If it was like Mm. something as simple as a smudged printing or something very small, right? That is what will likely come up during production. It's it's often, Mm. well, sometimes it's a surprise. Sometimes it's a surprise, but often it's something that you saw before and it just didn't get worked out for whatever reason. Um, And and so those are the things you want to be hyper vigilant about. Right, right. And you want to document them. (laughs) Document them. You document them. You see this on the second sample, one of them was like this. Here's a photo. It's not acceptable. And here's what, what we need. And you keep all of that in one master document, whatever you call it, right? Because mm-hmm. um, you need to remind them all the time yeah. about it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, this has been 
great. Uh, thanks a lot, Liz. This is full of full of information, full of good advice. I love chatting with you. It's wonderful. (laughs) So we can do it again. And thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you. And for the listeners, uh, we'll include a link to Liz's website, Learn to Make a Product, in the show notes. And uh, yeah, so thank you again, Liz. And uh, to everybody, uh, stay tuned and we'll be back next week with another episode. Thank you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast brought to you by the Sophie's Group. We're on a mission to provide you with everything you need to manufacture effectively in Asia, including inspections, auditing, new product development support, contract manufacturing, 3PL warehousing and fulfillment, and much, much more across Asia's key manufacturing areas. Visit us at sofeast.com. That's S-O-F-E-A-S-T dot com to learn more and get help. If you've enjoyed the podcast today, please do rate, review and share because it will really help others discover us too.